I am going to get the um, lecture content started. Um, so you guys have um, seen a lot of lectures already related to this material and the inspiration for this lecture was from some of the comments that have um, come up in the chat where um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was crystal clear on the concepts of driving pressure, um, compliance, and even though we're not presently doing a whole lot of them, best peak trial, just so that we're all using the same verbiage and everybody knows what is what. So I'm gonna try to do this in the style of a chalk talk and share my iPad screen. Okay. So I just wanted to point everybody to um, the MGH Ether Central website where these lectures um, from this series are all being recorded. So on Saturday, Dr. Corey Hardin had one where he went over the McHugh guidelines for management. Um, uh, last week or so, Dr. Bakshi talked about ARDS and PEEP titration. Um, there was a stealth post by Dr. Kuo um, that went over some basic ICU ventilation modes. And this is this particular talk is only eight minutes. So if anybody um, needs more of a refresher on some super basics, this is a great eight minute starting point. So if you'll bear with me for just a few minutes, um, there's a couple of super basics I'll go over before I get into um, the good stuff, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So we all know that um, the broad divisions of mechanical ventilation that we use in the ICU setting are the assist control modes, and pressure support, uh, pressure support ventilation. So we're gonna focus on assist control and the main two flavors of assist control that we see used are volume control and pressure control. And a lot of these concepts are a little easier to understand when talking about the volume control mode. So we're just gonna focus on that in this lecture today. So, time to draw some waveforms. So both on the ICU ventilator machine and also on the anesthesia machine, usually you have two waveforms um, going across the screen. And obviously the x-axis is going to be time. The top curve is going to be pressure and the bottom curve is going to be flow or change in volume with respect to time. So I'm going to draw a little dotted line for inhalation and exhalation. And we all remember that in positive pressure ventilation, for the volume control mode, um, the flow that the ventilator pushes at the patient is a square wave function. So during inspiration, a constant flow is being pushed into the patient's lungs, and the pressure in the patient's lungs is going to keep rising because keep, you keep pushing more and more flow in. And then on exhalation, the ventilator actually just turns off, but the waveform that you get is this, because at the flow sensor, it's measuring the passive exhalation of the patient. And the pressure curve drops. So that's the most uh, basic thing to understand about the waveforms, point number one. The second important point to have very crystal clear is what PEEP is doing in the picture. So when we add PEEP, we all know PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. So here's expiration. Here we were at zero PEEP. So the name of PEEP says that when we finish expiration, we're gonna have something left over, right? Which means when we start the breath, we're also gonna have something. And really what the PEEP does is just raises this whole curve by the amount that we've set, right? All very familiar. So here, let's say we've added five centimeters of water of PEEP. 
the beginning and the end of our curve will be raised by this little bit, but also the peak is going to be raised simply because of the extra peak that we've dialed in as well. So now with those very, very basics laid out, we're going to start talking about the dynamic and static components of the curve. And I will just add in a photograph um, from the uh, Alex Koo, um, Kuo lecture that I pointed out on the website where he goes into a little bit of detail on how to think of the pressure that the ventilator is delivering to the patient. But basically, the thing you want to think about is in our standard curve, This pressure that the ventilator is delivering to the patient is not necessarily the same thing as what, quote unquote, the lungs see. So the ventilator pressure includes a few different pressures all added together. And to really um, separate out what is required to just blow up the balloon and get past the resistance of the endotracheal tube and the large airways versus the pressure to expand the alveoli of the actual lung tissue against the pressure of the chest wall. You have to take flow out of the picture. So that's where a maneuver called an end inspiratory hold comes in. And so what are we actually doing with an end inspiratory hold? So we're going back to our basic curves. Here's flow, here's pressure. So during inspiration, the ventilator is pushing a constant flow. And we said normally during exhalation, the ventilator just lets go and lets the patient passively exhale. Let's say we have a little bit of peep. Here's our peak pressure. So during an end inspiratory hold, rather than allowing the patient to exhale, the ventilator um, is a little bit mean and just clamps things closed and holds the flow at zero. So you could think of that as like putting a, a Kelly clamp on the endotracheal tube and not letting the patient exhale. So what you find in the pressure curve when you do that to flow is that there is a drop in the pressure and you reach a new steady state. So this is our peak pressure. And this new pressure we refer to as the plateau pressure. And then finally, when you've let the end inspiratory hold go, you let the pa patient passively exhale and the pressure curve goes back down to the peep that you set. Could everybody mute their um, microphones in the background? <laughs> okay, so um, do, uh, does anybody have any questions so far on how we got to plateau pressure and um, peep pressure? So this pressure here, this delta P, is given the special name of driving pressure. It's defined as pressure plateau minus pressure P. And there's many amazing papers you can read about um, vent physiology, lung physiology, you can think of the driving pressure if you want to speak in layman's terms or, or sort of intuitively as the pressure with which you're kind of beating up the lungs. Because this pressure up here in your curve really doesn't have anything to do with beating up the lungs, right? That pressure is going to be raised by 
high resistance in the endotracheal tube, um, bronchospasm, mucus plugs, that kind of stuff. Um, when you take all those things out of the picture and all you're left with is the lung tissue itself and the chest wall, that's where the driving pressure comes into play. So the next um, concept is compliance. And in terms of physics, compliance is defined as a change in volume over a change in pressure. I can never get compliance. I was confused. Also of note, compliance is defined as the inverse of elastance. And I'm actually going to um, go back to my camera for one second. because I think this concept is best illustrated. Can you guys see me? Yeah, we can see you. Awesome. So I think this concept is best illustrated with rubber bands, because I know the first four times I read about compliance and elastance, it all seemed backwards. Um, so here is um, an elastic band that is really quite stiff. And here is a very loosey-goosey elastic band. So this elastic band has higher elastance. It wants to keep its shape. You have to do a lot of work to distend it. This elastic band, even though it's stretchier, it has lower elastance. It's easier to distend it. So using the inverse concepts, the loosey-goosey rubber band has much higher compliance, whereas this rubber band has low compliance. So if, we're, if you extrapolate um, the analogy from rubber band circles to imagining that these are three-dimensional alveoli, this would be your alveolus with low compliance, the stiff lung, the sad ARDS lung. And this would be loosey-goosey easily distendable compliant lung. So either normal lung or in the other extreme, uh, a COPD lung where the alveoli are like um, very dilated sacs. Okay. Back to the whiteboard. Okay, so the compliance we care about in the lungs is referred to as static compliance. And so we know we, we're gonna have in the numerator some kind of volume and in the denominator some kind of pressure. So which, vo the volume is easy to guess, right? There's only one volume we, we talk about and that's the tidal volume that we've dialed into the ventilator. And then which change in pressure? Well, we just said in this prior page that when we're talking about the static components of the lung, the driving pressure or the change in plateau minus PEEP is the relevant pressure that the lungs are um, seeing. So in the denominator, we have pressure plateau minus pressure PEEP or driving pressure. So no need to memorize anything. You can derive it all very logically from uh, first principles. And just as a reference point, um, normal static compliance would be something around 50 all the way up to um, 100 mils per uh, centimeters of water. And you'll know from your anesthesia machine, because everybody gets a lot of atelectasis when you put them under and on anesthesia, often uh, compliance of 30 to 40 looks pretty good. And if you have someone obese, uh, easily you can get down to the 20s. In the ICU, if you have someone in severe ARDS, you could easily see compliances of 10 or 15. So the next um, point I'd like to discuss 
is just illustrating things that raise pressure peak. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll have you convinced that thinking about compliance and driving pressure is a worthwhile effort. But peak is something we also hear um, thrown around a lot because most ventilators that we have, both in the ICU and in um, the ORs, don't automatically alarm at you if your driving pressure is high, but it's very easy to set those machines to have a peak pressure alarm. So that's something that's often brought to your attention. Oh, the, the peaks are high or the PIPs, peak inspiratory pressure is high. So we wanna think about the three different things that can raise your peak pressure. So one is an increase in airways resistance. So let's go back to our trusty curve. Let's pretend that we just did an end inspiratory hold maneuver. So if we have a resistance in the airways, that's something like the patient bit down and kinked the tube or there's a mucus plug in one of the large airways or the tube has a lot of junk in it. Um, or the patient has bronchospasm. So the lung parenchyma is not damaged or broken, simply the large airways have high resistance. By definition then, we haven't changed the peep that we've dialed in, so this part of the curve is gonna be the same. The static components are gonna be the same, so this is gonna not change. And the only thing that's gonna change here is this part of the curve. So we have, an increase in the peak pressure, but our driving pressure and our PEEP have not changed, okay? So just because someone brings to your attention that the peak is high, it doesn't necessarily mean you've suddenly developed um, stiff lungs. So the second thing is simply an increase in PEEP itself, right? So if we have our original curve, and this is our peep, I can make the peak look real high just by dialing in a whole bunch of peep, right? Because it's gonna change the baseline and everything is just gonna raise up by the amount of extra peep I've dialed in. But again, with this maneuver, the driving pressure hasn't changed, but the peak pressure looks really high. And then finally, the last thing that's going to raise your peak is a decrease in the static compliance. So in this case, we keep the same peak, but ooh, our driving pressure needs to be really high. Okay, so only in that last case is the driving pressure actually higher. So peak, is a, peak pressure is a useful tool because it's very easy to get off of the ventilator. You don't have to ask in, when you're in the ICU, the respiratory therapist to do any manipulations to get you any numbers, but just take it with a grain of salt because there's a lot of different things all at once um, happening to get you the peak pressure. It, it depends on the peep you've dialed in, your driving pressure, but also the resistance of the airways. So when I hear that a peak pressure is high, that really just tells me that I need to make a differential and think further about what's going on. And when I say figure out further what's going on, um, first thing I would do is look at the patient and make sure that the endotracheal tube doesn't have any issues. Um, put on your differential if the patient is bronchospastic or not. Take a look at if someone has just happened to dial in a really high PEEP. And then finally, if I'm suspecting that it's actually something with the compliance, I would do 
N and inspiratory hold maneuver to actually drive the driving pressure. Okay, the last thing here is best peak trial. So of note, this is something that we are not necessarily doing um, during the COVID pandemic on patients, but it is something that you will hear talked about or perhaps also proposed in certain patients. So I think it's very much worth discussing just so that we all know what it is and what we're talking about. So how, when you're in the ICU and you ask the respiratory therapist to do a best PEEP trial on your patient, what does that actually mean? What are they actually doing? So typically what's done is a so-called decremental PEEP trial, where first the patient's lungs are recruited up to a very high pressure, for example, 30 centimeters of water of PEEP. And then um, the PEEP is decreased stepwise. And at each PEEP, you know what tidal volume you've set the ventilator to. You do an end, inspir end inspiratory hold maneuver and measure the driving pressure at each PEEP. And then you plot a curve. And what you typically see is something like this. So you end up getting a curve with three different slopes. And what is the slope of this curve? Well, it's y over x, tidal volume over driving pressure. And you'll remember from the previous page that that is our compliance. So during a best PEEP trial, at different PEEPs, you have two regions where the compliance is not so hot, and then one sweet spot range where the compliance is really good. So what's actually happening there? Well, you can think of the, the cartoon way of explaining it is that here you have a lot of lung that is atelectatic, underfilled, um, under distended alveoli that are collapsing with every breath. And as you increase your PEEP, you're popping op open more alveoli, recruiting more good lung. And when you've done enough of that, you get into a good part of your curve where your lung is nice and compliant. And then if you keep pushing that, at some point, the alveoli get over distended. And if you think of the rubber band, when you've stretched the rubber band past where it really wants to go, it stops being stretchy and kind of starts acting like a stiff rubber band all over again. At the same time, if you are a middle alveolus and your two neighbor alveoli are really over distended and puffy, you might collapse in the middle. So both of those things together will um, actually cause your compliance of the lung to look less good. So in the best PEEP trial, which PEEP, when you, when you have this curve, which PEEP do you pick in the end? So usually it's the lowest PEEP that gets you on the good part of the curve, okay? So one thing that's been discussed in some of the other lectures on the website are that for the COVID patients, we are presently not doing best PEEP trials as a regular, um, as a regular practice and part of it is practicality. It's a resource intensive thing where it takes a respiratory therapist a while in there um, to do it. So it's, it's dual fold, it uses up the, the resource, the precious resource of a, of a respiratory therapist being in one location for a long time. And second, it's a long exposure for somebody to be in there doing that manipulation. And um, it's been the experience, institutional experience so far, this is a screen cap from Corey Harden's lecture that um, he talked about how aggressive recruitment maneuvers um, are probably not the best thing to be doing. And so far it seems like using PEEP based on the ARDSnet table, uh, the, the patients have done okay. So for now, um, 
that is certainly the starting point that we can use. And so really to sum it all up, lung protective ventilation. So during the COVID um, pandemic, you've heard a lot about ARDS and that really this is a supportive therapy kind of game. Patients on ventilators for a long time and just doing very careful, very judicious um, management with lung protective ventilation. And so the three things that are gonna make up the lung uh, protective ventilation are low tidal volumes, so six to eight cc's per kilo predicted body weight. That's from the ARDSnet. There's some evidence that you wanna keep your peak pressure less than 30 centimeters of water. But remember what we talked about in the other slides that you want to be mindful of peak pressure, but you also don't want to be fooled by peak pressure because high peak pressures don't necessarily mean that you're beating the lungs up with a high driving pressure, right? Lots of things can cause your peak pressures to be high. And then the third thing, which was really the point of this lecture, is to understand driving pressure. And the driving pressure we think we want to be less than is 15 centimeters of water. And where does that come from? The evidence for that um, was mentioned both in Dr. Hardin's lecture and if you look at Aranya Bakchi's um, lecture on peak titration in ARDS with cardiac issues. Um, this Amato paper, New England Journal 2015, um, illustrates the point that driving pressure matters for mortality. So I'm going to go back on the camera and off of the notes for a minute. Can you guys see me again? Yes. So that, that was really, um, that was really it. I just wanted to break down in really simple terms, compliance and driving pressure, since those are two really important concepts in the management of ARDS. Any questions? I, I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, so um, in the lecture of Dr. Hardin this weekend, he said that our patients um, de-recruit when they're uh, moved from prone to supine. So what is the recruitment maneuver that they're using? You're just following the ARDS net, uh, FIO2, PEEP, table to recruit the patient again or are they doing any specific recruitment maneuvers that would be an awesome question for somebody to answer who has recently um, flipped a patient prone in the unit so uh, i'm not actually sure um, what people have been doing i imagine that probably if the patient de recruits you may have to on that on that uh in that moment uh re-recruit the patient, but I'm not actually sure what people have been doing the last week. Anybody online know? But you're right, Diana, it makes sense that you would probably have to recruit at that point, but I, I think the point Dr. Hardin was making was that um, uh, you want to save your recruitment maneuvers for when you really need them and not just be recruiting the patient multiple times during the day. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Katarina. This is Evan. Kind of hey, a simple, Evan. similar question. Um, I just posted the comment. I forget who gave the first ARDS lecture, but they talked about, you know, how we can really hurt people with recruitment maneuvers. And I think that that was uh, especially in the setting of like right sided heart strain. I, you, I know you mentioned going up to 30 um, and then um, starting your best PEEP, but before you recruit for best PEEP trials, 
outside of kind of Diana's proning question, how are, how do you advise doing that? In the OR, we typically can get away with aggressive recruitment maneuvers, but it sounds like that's something that we should not be doing in these patients. Yeah. So um, we're used to thinking about the OR vents where you have the bag that you can squeeze and then you can uh, use your little um, meter to see how many centimeters of water you've gone up to by squeezing the bag. And the ICU ventilators don't have the same kind of bag to squeeze, for lack of a more elegant way of saying it. So going up to 30 centimeters of water peep is the recruitment. So it's, it's basically the, it's the same thing as squeezing the bag, right? You're, you're setting the peep to 30 and that's the pressure that, that the, um, the circuit is then delivering to the patient. And are they doing that immediately? So if you were going to do a best PEEP trial on someone who's at a PEEP of five, they just immediately change it to a PEEP of 30, or this is something that they're doing over the course of an hour or something? No, I think not over the course of an hour, but um, you go up fairly quickly up to the 30. Okay, thank you. Katerina. Katerina. No. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so one thing I was just wondering is what do they with the standardized table with the FIO2 and the PEEP, do they do a recruit maneuver before they start up titrating there? Or do they just start on the current settings and then just progressively go up that chart without doing a recruit maneuver to prevent these hemodynamic changes that we might see? Um, so if you're just going with the table, that's just the PEEP that you dial in. Yeah. And if, if you look at the table, they're actually pretty low. I mean when that table was made, those were considered higher peeps, then everyone's gotten recalibrated and those are now kind of normal intuitive peeps. Um, but you would just dial in the eight or the 10 or whatever the table tells you. Yeah, thank you. Hey Katarina, this is Francis. I have a question yeah. about um, paralytic because I just remember when I first learned about peeps, peep trials, uh, the teaching was that patient has to be paralyzed in order for this to be like a true um, in, uh, best PEEP trial. Um, in the ICUs now, are we doing that? Are we like giving patients a bolus of paralytic right before we do this? Or um, because I know that we're not routinely paralyzing everybody. Yeah. Well, although I think we'll be seeing more and more probably paralyzed patients until all the paralytics run out. I hope they don't run out. Um, but yeah, you're right that this is a, a little bit of a point of contention. Some, sometimes the classic teaching is that, yes, you need paralytic on board. And that makes sense, right? If you, if you think about the analogy in the OR, if your patient is on pressure support, breathing on their own, and then you try to squeeze the bag and recruit them, they're going to cough. They're going to do all sorts of things where you're not actually gonna be able to measure anything, you're just gonna be fighting the patient. Um, I would contend that in the setting of ARDS, um, where you have lots and lots and lots of anesthetic agents, sedatives piled on to make the patient compliant with a ventilator, you are basically reaching a point logically where you are paralyzing them with your sedation. Um, so the analogy being one MAC on the ventilator, even without paralytic, 50% of the patients don't move. So at some point, if your anesthetic is high enough, the patient isn't going to move and their airway isn't going to react to the maneuver. Um, but definitely, if the patient is not sedated uh, to a very, very high level, you're not going to be able to do a PEEP trial or get any meaningful numbers because the patient will be interacting with the ventilator and fighting you. Got it. So in the ICUs now, um, the RTs are sort of coordinating it so that the patient is super deep. I know that's very difficult to sedate them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, my understanding is that we are not routinely doing best PEEP trials um, for the COVID patients but just good to know if you if you were to want to do one what it entails but yeah the patient either um, needs to be paralyzed then you can guarantee that they're not going to fight you and your numbers are going to be meaningful or 
um, they basically need to be paralyzed, quote unquote, uh, with extremely high sedation without having an axial neuromuscular blocker on board. So, so Katarina, just from my experience in Ellison 4, and this sort of goes with off of Francis's question, um, what I've noticed is they sort of coordinate it with intubation. So after they give the, the slug of rock uranium, many times, they might have changed this in the last few days, the respiratory therapist would do a, a brief sort of uh, best uh, peep right at the time of intubation. And then they would sort of set it there. And then on That's the That's a smart way to piggyback off of the... Um neuromuscular blocker that's yeah, already because, that you get for free for intuition yeah, because i've had some patients that are on you know max doses of sort of well max what i think is pretty high doses of ketamine presidex dilated propofol and still desynchronous and so like these yeah. patients you require quite a bit of sedation so i think they're yeah. trying to take advantage of that before they become desynchronous mm -hmm. and then this was just something we discussed on rounds was and obviously i don't know maybe it's changed but talking about best peep of you know, sort of once you get the best peep, you stay on that for 48 hours before you reevaluate. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just what I've seen. So. Mm -hmm. There's, and there's a lot of literature um, on peep, best peep trials. Um, we have a culture at our institution of utilizing esophageal balloons. So this is a whole huge topic of how to find the best peep and, um, I'm not trying to claim in this lecture that a decremental PEEP trial is the best way to do it, just that it is, a, it is something that you will see done. Um, and so I just wanted everyone to be very clear on what was actually going on during the best PEEP trial. Any other questions? All right, guys, thanks for joining the meeting, and uh, we will adjourn. Have a safe and productive day, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you.